So today we're gonna to talk about cone value and we're gonna talk about how cone value relates to the way that we fire things here in the ceramic studio at Riverside Community College. The reason why I say the name of our school here is because we do it a specific way. A lot of community studios do it the same way, but some do it slightly differently. For example, at one of the other colleges I used to teach at, we fired to a lower bisque fire temperature. Um, and we fired a glaze temperature to a lower glaze fire temperature than we do here at Riverside City College. When I was doing a residency in China, they mostly once fire everything, which means they just put it in the kiln once rather than putting it in for a bisque fire and a glaze fire. And so things happen differently in different places. There's not one answer to how you fire things always, okay? Um, so um, we're gonna talk really quickly about the cone, uh, the cone values, how they start at these numbers down here that have a zero in front of them. So this would be called cone O22. And then we go up in temperature, going this direction on the scale until we get to cone 10. Notice there's no zero in front of that 10, right? There is a cone O10 that would be somewhere over here, okay? So basically what it means is if you have a zero in front of the number, it's a lower temperature. If you don't have a zero in front of the number, it's a higher temperature, okay? As it goes down this direction, lower in temperature, you'll notice that the numbers are going bigger. One, two, three, four, O6, cone O22, right? The numbers are getting higher as they go down in the scale, but that's because they have that zero in front of them, much like a negative number. So think of these like negative numbers, okay? Then as we come up here higher on the cone value chart, cone one, two, three, four, five, six, so on and so forth, up to cone 10. It goes higher than cone 10, but we're just stopping at cone 10 because this cone 10 is what we fire our glaze kilns here at Riverside City College. So um, just so you guys get an idea. So we'll talk a little bit about temperature and time, okay? Because this scale is based on not just temperature. It's not like baking in your oven. Well, it's maybe even a little bit like baking in your oven because you've probably all experienced this where you bake something and the box says you're supposed to bake it for 22 or 19 to 22 minutes, right? There's no exactness that's there. It's the same thing with our scale here, right? So it's more about temperature and time than it is just about temperature value, okay? And that time is dependent upon the last stage of the firing where, depending on how quickly we're firing the kiln. If I'm firing a kiln and within the last hour of the firing, I go up 300 degrees within one hour, the temperature value is gonna be higher than what is listed maybe on the chart. Let's say that at cone 06 on the chart, it might say that the number is 1,946 degrees Fahrenheit. If I fired really quickly at the end of the firing cycle, then it might not reach cone 06 and get that melt that we're looking for until maybe around 1,970 degrees or 60 degrees, right? If I fire it slower and I go even slower than 100 degrees over the last hour of the firing cycle, then it's not gonna fire at, 06 is gonna uh, melt at a lower temperature. So it might be 1,928 degrees that it melts rather than 1,946. So those numbers are not necessarily used, okay? Instead, what we use is we use cones. And I've got these cones, these are, this is why we call them cones is because they're physically cones, right? This is a cone pack that's been made that hasn't been fired. So all the cones are upright. This is one that has been fired. You can see that the, this first one is melted all the way down into this little cup. And this one is starting to bend over, okay? This right here is cone, let's see, what did I put in here? I think that's cone 08, yeah. Cone 08, this is cone 07, this is cone 06. So this did not get to cone 06, right? It barely got to cone 07, definitely got to cone 08, right? So we use these inside of the kilns to see where the heat is, where the cone value is within the kiln, because what we're looking for is not a temperature, we're looking for melt. 
glazes melt, right? So we're trying to get to a, portion, a, a point where that glaze will actually melt as we're firing the kiln, right? So that's how the kind of temperature time thing happens, okay? So um, when we fire a bisque kiln here at Riverside City College, we're going to cone 06, right? Sometimes if we're firing low temperature commercial glazes, what you want to do in most cases is you want to actually bisque fire to a higher temperature like cone 04. And then you'll glaze fire for those low temperature glazes at cone 06. And one of the reasons why we do that is because when we take it a little bit higher up in va cone value, there's some gases that will come off of the, um, or out of the, um, the clay that we don't want to have come out when we fire the glaze firing, right? If we fire the bisque fire at cone 06 with the low temperature commercial glazes, and then we fired the glaze firing at cone 06, you might see some imperfections in the glaze. Some bubbling, some uh, blistering, maybe small little, um, I don't know, pinholes or something inside of the uh, glaze. There's some defects that can basically happen if you uh, do that. So that's why with those low temperature commercial glazes, we typically like to fire a Tacono 4 as the bisque firing and then glaze fire at cone 06. Here at Riverside, when we are firing our cone 10 kilns, which is our glaze, our glaze value for um, uh, what we have our glazes at, um, we bisque fire at cone 06 and then we glaze fire at cone 10, right? And it's okay to do that when we're firing these higher firings, right? Um, it doesn't, it goes higher than cone 10, like I said, probably to about cone 14, cone 15, something like that. Some wood fire kilns go that long. Some porcelains need to go a little bit uh, higher in temperature uh, to vitrify, to be, become, uh, to become uh, basically as hard as they should be, right? Porcelain is a clay that's a much harder clay body than some of the clays we're using here in the studio, right? Um, so now I wanna uh, talk about how we tell when we look at an object whether or not it's been bisque fired or if it hasn't been bisque fired. So I've got two pieces here. This is a piece of greenware. If you remember what greenware is, greenware means that it hasn't been fired yet. Doesn't matter what dryness stage, right? But it does matter um, that it hasn't been fired. That's the big thing. Okay, so. If I take this and I hold it down low like this on the foot and give it a flick, it has a very dead sound to it. The frequency of sound is very low as well. It's not a high pitch noise. It's a very low pitch noise. So you can actually also feel it as you're um, holding on to it when you do this, okay? If I take a piece that's been bisque fired and I do the same thing, we have sound that resonates. So if you're feeling it, you might actually feel it in your hand a little bit longer, and it might feel like a higher frequency noise as well. But that tells us that it's been bisque fired, because what happens in the bisque firing is all those silica molecules, they all bond together. And because they bond together, when I flick it, sound resonates. In that, that's just dirt suspended in air. It won't do that because it hasn't gone through that quartz inversion where all of the silica molecules bond together and form a very specific matrix, okay? The other thing is if it's bisque fired, if I take my nail and I scratch this, it feels really weird on my finger and it kind of sounds weird, but it doesn't scratch the surface of this object. If I were to do the same thing to a piece that hasn't been bisque fired yet, I'll do it down on the very bottom here it actually leaves a mark. I don't know if you can see that, but you can see that it left a mark there and the clay came off of my finger because the clay is just suspended in air, right? I'm able to do that when it's not bisque fired, okay? And once you get the, the feel of things, um, I've been doing this for long enough that when I'm going and I'm loading kilns, even if a piece has been glazed, sometimes we've had students that have accidentally done this. They've glazed a piece that was not yet bisque fired. Right? 
when I lift it up and I start to put it in the kiln, I can tell just by touching it. So, but that, ta that takes a lot of time to get that feel, all right? Um, so we want to make sure that we have bisque fired pieces when we go to glaze, all right? That's the big thing. That's the number one, like step number one is to make sure that it's a bisque fired object, all right? So we want bisque fired pieces when we're glazing here at our studio. Later on, if you get uh, more advanced in ceramics, some people start doing those once firings. It's a little bit harder to do. Glazes have to be formulated a little bit differently because they're gonna shrink all at once rather than over the course of that last firing, right? That last firing, the object shrinks quite a bit less. In that bisque firing, your object shrinks, but it hasn't shrunk all the way quite yet. Once it goes into the glaze firing, higher in temperature, it'll shrink a little bit more. Okay, so the other thing I want to, or the last thing I want to talk about is that when we go into the glaze studio and we start um, glazing objects, you need to have your notebook with you, your sketchbook, I mean, because you're going to be drawing a little road map of what it is that you're going to be doing. Okay, and we're going to talk about that next. So when we get into the glaze studio and we have our notebooks with us, our sketchbooks with us, we're gonna be drawing our objects. Now, this is a ceramics class, it's not a drawing class. So I'm not grading you or anyone on the quality of their drawings. As long as you can tell what object you're glazing, that's cool with me, right? So this is much like that cup that you just saw me using over there. It's got the little foot on it. We've got a little squared off handle. We can see that it's some sort of a cylinder shape, okay? That's all that's really that really matters. You know, some people, when they draw in their sketchbooks, maybe they just do it like this, right? And then they put their handle on it, if there's a handle. That's okay, too. There's not, the difference between this and that is that this is drawn to look more three-dimensional, and that's just because I put an ellipse up here at the top, and I have a little bit of a, a portion of ellipse down here, right, to show that it's a little bit more three-dimensional, right? You can choose to try and do this if you would like to, but you don't have to, you can do this, okay? Um, some people, especially when we get into throwing, some people number their cylinders that they throw on the wheel because a lot of the cylinders tend to look the same, okay? Some just might be wider, some are taller and narrower, some are tall but still wide. It all just depends on what you make as the student, right? Um, and that's okay. But we wanna draw some sort of a road map when we do the glazing because I want you guys to start to understand how glazes interact with one another. Because you'll see when we get to the demonstration of how to glaze that glaze looks nothing like it looks when it comes out of the kiln. For example, the one that I mentioned here, Jet Black, it has like a, a pinkish maroon look to it when it gets dipped. And then when it goes into the kiln and fires, it actually melts and turns black and shiny. Doesn't look black and shiny at all, right? And the Winokur yellow is a light pink kind of a color. Doesn't look anything like Winokur yellow. Winokur yellow is like a white, whitish glaze that has a yellowish kind of tone to it, okay? So, on this piece, when I was in the studio, or in the glaze studio and I was firing this piece, the first thing that I did is I dipped it into the jet, jet black. So what I did, and I, when I dipped it, I dipped it so that there was an angled line on it. So when I dipped it down in, I didn't dip it straight. I dipped it sideways, okay? You don't have to do that, right? This is just what I did on this specific piece. Does that make sense? All right? So I dipped that right there, okay, to that, to that line. Then I let it dry which is very quick. It drives over like less, less than a minute, it's dry, okay? And you're able to touch it. And then what I did is I dipped it into Winokur yellow, okay? And when I dipped it into the Winokur yellow, I overlapped the jet black with the Winokur yellow. I probably did it about a half an inch, right? It doesn't have to be a half an inch. It could be a quarter of an inch if you want. It could be more than that if you want, right? That's the second one that I dipped. So when I, Mention this right here. This is Winokur yellow over jet black. 
The reason why it's important to notate that in your sketchbook is because Winokur yellow over top of jet black is going to look different than jet black over Winokur yellow. So we need to know in that roadmap that you draw out, we need to know which one was done first and second and if there even is an overlap. Sometimes you may be like, you know what, I just want this one to be blue, so I'm gonna dip it in the cobalt blue and that's it. Maybe you use some underglaze, maybe you use some slip, maybe you had a marbled clay body that was underneath, notate that. Let yourself know, you're not letting me know, you're letting yourself know I just want you to do this because this uh, helps us to understand glazes better if we write these roadmaps as to how we did this. So in your sketchbook, you've got a single page, right? We're supposed to have like an eight and a half by 11 or around that size sketchbook. Put two pieces on each page. Don't, try, don't draw little itty bitty things like this and then put 19 of them on the same page, okay? It's gonna be hard for you to even understand that, okay? So try and do it and get it a little bit larger so we can actually see what it is that you're doing. And when I say we, I more mean you, okay? And you'll have to do this. Anytime you go to a new studio, you'll want to keep track of what you do with the glazes so you can see what these glazes look like afterwards. That's one of the beauties that I like about ceramics is actually when we, um, get into the glaze studio and we start dipping things, you have to imagine in your head what this object is gonna look like, right? You can't just dip it in and be like, oh, yep, that's what it looks like, and bada boom, bada bing, you're done, right? Painters have, and, draw, and people that draw, that happens right on the page as you're using it. You know that when you pull out red paint and you start painting with red paint, it's not gonna change from red to another color unless you go over it or unless you mix it with another color. It looks exactly like it's gonna look when we mix it on our palette. Totally different in the glaze studio. It looks way different. So we have to have this imagination. We have to have this foresight into see thinking about what it's gonna look like. What might happen with this where we have Winokur yellow over jet black is the Winokur yellow might break a little bit strangely and it might look like cracked earth essentially over that jet black because the jet black is a very liquidy glaze, very shiny. The Winokur yellow is more of a satin matte glaze and it doesn't move quite as much in the firing process. So that could be something that's really interesting. The other thing I want you to think about when we go into the glaze studio is think about, our, uh, think about the elements and principles of design and think about color stuff, right? Maybe we wanna choose two, piece, two colors that we put together Maybe we want to choose ones that are contrasting like this, a very dark glaze. Winokur yellow is a very light glaze. So that's a contrast, that light and that dark, right? Maybe you dip the whole thing in jet black and then you're gonna use like something to squeeze or flick or put some other color on top of it. So that way that those two interact. That's something that's, uh, that's you're able to do as well. And glazing, we could talk about glazing for an entire semester and still not go over all the possibilities of what you can do with glaze and ceramics, right? I'm even constantly learning and seeing new things as we're going through, all right? So this is the introduction to glazing. The next step is that we're gonna be going into the glaze studio and then I'm gonna show you guys actually how we're gonna be dipping these objects uh, because the materials that we use, the glazes we use here, are dipping glazes where we dip into a vat of glaze or a container of glaze. We're not gonna be using brushes to brush stuff on, okay? That's not the way that this material works that we have here at Riverside City College.